It started with just like six of us. Then it went to 12, 20. And the whole time, we've, we've, we've just created space for God to minister and move. Uh, yes, there's been teaching. Yes, there's been um, the traditional facets of church. We've had that. But it's always been unto the presence of God just taking over and wrecking us. gosh, I'm so sorry. So that's been very beautiful, but our kids grew up in an atmosphere in our home where we would worship and we would have people in and they, just his presence has been such, it's just been such an integral part of our marriage. And then especially, you know, when we had kids of raising them in his presence and just knowing God's not, it's not some cerebral, you know, he's not a theological concept, but he's real and he's accessible and learning to not only encounter him in, in his presence, you know, with people in our home with worship, but as a family and even for me and my husband, just I think I would say God himself and his presence is a foundation of our lives, our marriage, our family. I couldn't, I wouldn't know how to parent or do marriage without the Lord. I think the thing that has kept me close with the Lord is just finally realizing how easy it is to know Him and to love Him and to be His friend. I think I put so many expectations on myself of what it looked like to be a Christian my whole life, and those expectations were like a burden, and they crushed me every single time. And I think when I finally met Jesus just as my friend, and that was all that He wanted from me, He didn't want anything else but friendship. When I realized that, everything became like so much easier. And so it's no longer like a to-do list of things that I need to do throughout a week to make sure that I'm 
acting a certain way or like behaving like a Christian should behave. It's just friendship with a man and and that's how easy it is. It's simple. Just join with his song over us tonight. By confessing the name of Jesus, you got grafted into this plan and it's a plan of redemption that's still playing out today. And so the Maranatha cry, as much as it is about what's to come, it's also understanding what has been. We're stuck in this tension of the kingdom is here and the kingdom is coming. There's this, this hope of glory that's within us, but this hope of glory that's coming. And we need to emphasize both, but, but one leads to the other and the other leads to one like there's this beautiful tension and dance between these two realities and you have people that are like it's all about the now and i'm like yes it's about the now but it's also about the until it's all about the until yes it is about the until but it's also about the now there's this urgency in the here and the now that the maranatha cry brings it's not an escapist like oh god bail us out it's there's a coming kingdom that's within me there's a coming kingdom that's around me there's a coming kingdom that you're invited into to learn actually from Latin America and the Latin American church. Um, what God is doing there is unbelievable. Yeah. The churches I've connected with, the purity, the zeal, the hunger for, for the Lord, it, it, it's so convicting. And so it's the honor of my ministry so far is, is my relationship with Marcos and what God's about to do in South America. I just yeah. am happy to have a front row seat.
I just, I'm deciding where I'm gonna go. Um, it's better than I could have ever, ever dreamed of. It's better than I could have ever planned. It's making music, making music with my family, with my best friends, and all of a sudden, like, we started off in this building at Oaklawn, you know, and, and then just worshiping together because we love the Lord. And, whew, and, and then coming to this building, you know, and the fact that I get to be a part of it, whether it's singing, whether it's setting up, whatever, it's just, I'm just so honored because it's such an answer to my prayers, but it's so much different than I thought, but it's better.
Good morning. Good morning. Um, we're going to worship, so everybody stand. And if you want to come to the front, you can. Your babies can come to the front. I'm so excited to be here. It's so, um, oh, I got emotional. It's like so beautiful that we get to do this. It's just like hitting me. And we get to call this place home. And we get to call these people family. So God, we're just grateful this morning. Thank you for this place, God. Thank you for this room. Thank you for the people in it. We invite you, Holy Spirit. Come have your way again, Lord. Thank you, God. To you, the slain and risen 
King. We lift our voice with heaven, singing worthy, Lord of all. On through this life we lead, and through eternity. Yeah.
Oh, boy. 
That phrase, um, my God, my joy, my delight. Um, we're about to receive communion. You can stay standing, but grab it. Should be in your seat there. It's also up front if you need it. I've asked my friend Alzavian to come up and help me. In pre-service prayer, we, you know, we're praying for you and for our time together and we sensed um, the Lord's desire to uh, release and impart joy. And we, end, we always end with our hands in the middle, one, two, three, and we declare something. And today it was enjoy, both I in joy and E in joy, that we would enjoy being in joy, his joy. <laughs> and um, I wanna take communion in a specific way. I've been thinking during worship uh, about Passover, we just celebrated Passover a few weeks ago. And if you're unfamiliar, uh, in Passover, there's four cups of wine over the duration of the meal. And each cup um, represents something. And it's in the third cup, which is the cup of redemption that Jesus broke bread and poured wine and said, behold, this is the new covenant in my blood that he was declaring himself as the Passover lamb who didn't just deliver for a moment or for a temporary freedom, but was the Passover lamb that set us free forever. But the cup of redemption is the third cup. It's not the fourth cup. <laughs> and the fourth cup is a cup of joy or a cup of praise. And because of the cup of redemption in the body and blood of Jesus, we now get to live in the reality of the fourth cup. That we get to live in the joy and the praise of the overflow of all that Jesus accomplished for us. That it's not our own joy, it's not our own feeling, it's not emotional, it's his joy that strengthens us. And I wanna tell you the truth is, if you're hoping that, man, I'll get, I'll get happy. I'll get happy when this thing changes or when that position comes or when I start making X amount of dollars or when so-and-so finally acknowledges that I'm doing, man, you're gonna be chasing joy forever. Because it's not, it's not divine strategy, it's not divine provision, it's not emotion that strengthens us, it's the joy of the Lord. And the joy of the Lord is found in the cup of the Lord. It's in his life. And so we're about to partake something eternal and mystical, that this is not just whatever you wanna call this wafer thing, <laughs> styrofoam and grape juice. This is the body and blood of Jesus. This is as close as we can get to touching him before he returns. We're holding our beloved. And so we often receive it in remembrance of redemption and we certainly can do that today. But if you're weary, man, if your heart is heavy, you're going through it, <laughs> and you're just like holding on until something changes, this cup fills you with his joy, and his joy sustains you and somehow satisfies you even when nothing changes. And when that's the reality, man, we shine like stars in the universe. <laughs> because the devil can't manufacture that and the world's got no claim on that, but that's our inheritance, beloved. Amen. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take the bread and then Alzavian, who so embodies the joy of the Lord, is going to pray for the cup of joy. So if you take the bread and Jesus, <laughs> we are so thankful that you put on flesh 
that you dwelt among us. That because you, the eternal, glorious Son of God, became man, you know us because you were us. You know our weaknesses, our frailty, our desire, our limitations, our beauty and strength. You know it all because you were found as man. Jesus, we thank you for your obedience in every breath to walk obedient to the Father, to walk in full dependence to Holy Spirit, to fully embody his nature, his character, to reveal his ways and his face to us. And that in your body broken, you are declaring to us that we can follow you because your body was broken, we can partake of your wholeness, that we now partake of your divine nature. What a gift you've given us in your body broken. Thank you, thank you, thank you for the bread of belonging that we now hold and we receive it in joy that we belong to you. In Jesus' name, you can take the bread. Okay. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> now open up your cups. Now listen to it. Listen to it. Open it up. Now say this with me. Say this cup. This cup is dangerous. Is dangerous. Do you know why? Why? No, you say do you know why? Oh. Do you know why? Well, I thought you guys knew. <laughs> you know why this is dangerous? Why? Why? I'm going to tell you. <laughs> <laughs> Debt been paid. This, I like to say that this is the cup of debt's been paid. Say that with me. Debt's been paid. Have you ever had a debt collector call you? <laughs> There's no more harassment. There's no more offering wow. for sins. Wow. This is a celebration. So before we drink it, our prayer is going to be a, a loud celebration. One, two, three. Hooray! 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 Drink up, drink up. Something ain't right when you take the cup, man. Something ain't right. That's amazing. Thank you. Oh, my gosh. We bless you, Jesus. Thank you. We love you. And we love you. Thank you, team. Thank you for leading us so beautifully, man. Hey, say hello to somebody next to you. Look them in the eyes. Welcome them. Give them a hug. See the joy of the Lord in one another's faces. Jesus said himself, there'll be joy in the house of prayer. <laughs> Gosh, and we need it. We need it. We need his joy. Um, <laughs> hey, if you're visiting with us, man, we're so, so glad that you're here. What We welcome you. Uh, I want to let you know as you leave today, uh, if you stop over at the Connect table, which is the table right out here to your left below the TV, um, we have a little gift for you. So if it's your first time visiting us, uh, we just want to bless you. And so stop by that table, pick up a gift. If you've been coming for a while, but you're looking for ways uh, to get plugged in or find out more information about who we are and all the, the various things that we have going on day by day around here, 
uh, please stop by the Connect table and they can hook you up with a bunch of information and ways to get connected. Uh, if we can put up the giving, there it is. Perfect, you're before me. Hey, we want to be, speaking of the cup of praise, we want to be people that don't just praise with our lips, but praise with our actions, amen? Worship with our lifestyle. That looks like lives of generosity, both the habit and the willingness. It's a lifestyle of generosity. It's how we not only protect our hearts from getting seduced by either the fear or love of money, but it's how we testify with our lives that we are fully confident that all that we need comes from Jesus, that he is our provision, he sustains us, he provides all that's needed, in fact, above and beyond what's needed. So um, if you're part of the house, this is the time where you bring your tithe. You can use the QR code or those various ways to give. There's boxes in the corner you can drop um, checks or cash in. If you're visiting, please give as well. This is good soil. Um, keep your tithe in your local church, church of course, but man, please uh, sow into what God's doing here. It's, um, it's beautiful what's happening in this community. So, all righty. I want to invite um, Javanna Charrington, our women's pastor, up as you. Yes. We, I call her the teapot because when she's in the spirit, she's like, Mah! it's like, it's amazing. But, um, you know, last, was it just last weekend? Golly, last weekend, um, over 300 of you ladies were at Bloom for a weekend away. What, what? And so she's going to give a little testimony about all that the Lord did, which was profound. So let her rip. Yeah, where are my Bloom women at? Ah! It was so fun. So we had a range of women from 18 to 78 at Bloom. How incredible is that? Multi-generational, it was awesome. Divine friendships were made, connections were made. Um, women that hadn't been seen in a long time got seen. <laughs> they got looked in the eyes. They got massages from other women. It was sweet. Um, the It was incredible the way the Lord showed up in freedom, he broke strongholds. Um, women got freed and salvations were there. God showed up. Yeah, let's give God a hand on that. Um, Larissa did an amazing job of leading women to the feet of Jesus as she talked about the, the woman at the well. It was super powerful that night. Um, someone uh, prayed over a woman of a, she was in the DFW area, a, another church, and she was like, hey, what is tongues? And walked her through tongues, and she received tongues that night. Um, and what else? There were, um, there, one of my favorite testimonies was someone who had had um, miscarriages. Um, she, had had, she had lost her, her twins around 16 weeks. And um, there was an older woman in her cabin praying for her in the night. And in the night, that woman had a dream that there was a woman in her cabin praying for her. She got set free and she's never the same. Her emotional, she got emotional uh, healing that night. There was relational healing. There were, um, I think, one, another, just freedom and dance. We um, let go, and it was amazing to see the power of dance uh, one of the nights and just how we were dancing and just being silly, but freedom came in the room and God met us. So I am so, I just wanna, can y'all just stand up with me and give God a shout for what he did in women? Thank you, God! We honor you, Jesus! And listen, if you weren't there, I just believe there's gonna be an impartation. We're gonna give specific bloom testimonies at the women's gathering this Tuesday night in the overflow at 6.30. So if you weren't there and you wanna be a part, I just believe God's gonna come and activate. So come join us. Also another sweet time, okay, y'all can sit down now. Another sweet moment was mamas. Where are my mamas at? How many mamas felt seen and loved and refreshed? Um, that was a really powerful moment as well. Cindy, brought the worship, McKenna brought the worship. It was incredible. So thank y'all so much for just, yeah, coming and being a part, amen. Yay. Watch out. So join Javanna and others this Tuesday in Overflow. Ladies, come partake. Hey, um, before I invite Peter Lewis, who's gonna be bringing the word today, um, could you put your head, hand on your head? And let's pray. Um, Holy Spirit, we offer you our minds today. We lay our brains, our opinions, our preconceived notions, our beliefs, 
before you, and we declare, Spirit of God, you lead us into truth. You reveal truth. You instruct in truth. You are truth. So we offer you our minds. Come instruct us today. Renew our minds by your word and in your presence, Jesus. Set us free. In Jesus' name, amen. If you would stand and properly honor none other than Peter Lewis. You can be seated. Good morning. Well, um, I'm experiencing God, which is awesome. God's meant to be experienced, isn't he? Hmm. I want to I want to share a couple uh, testimonies. Is that what, what you call it? I have one testimony that Miller wanted me to share. So last week, we took up an offering for Gen Z for Jesus. Uh, September 9th, am I right? Yes, say whoop, okay. Um, We're gathering in Los Angeles uh, with Gen Z, um, and we believe God is doing something with Gen Z in our nation, and that one voice uh, and Brian and his team and Marcella um, are really prophets to that generation in our nation. I wanna say that, I said that publicly uh, at prayer, but but they really are. They they have the ear of Gen Z, which is a generation. If you don't know, is is being bombarded in a way that we've never seen before, um, just with lies and culture. And and these guys and their team have the ear to speak the word of God and to see salvation and revival among Gen Z. Uh, my eldest daughter, Faith, is is the fruit of their ministry. Um, and I want to just testify to you, my daughter is on fire in public school, preaching the gospel in her public school. N- not a program, not a, it's not a deal. She just, I, hey, hey, Faith, how was your day? It was good. What'd you do? I, I shared the gospel with some of my friends. Yeah, you did. Tell me about that. And, and I want to just, as a parent, articulate that I'm aware of the tension of public school and, and all of that. And yet, and yet we were made to raise our kids to be on offense. We're not playing defense, church. I'll maybe talk about that later. I got fired up last night. Um, but we raised $50,000 last week for Gen Z for Jesus. Come on. So let's continue to sow. Uh, that's just a testimony. Um, I wanted to acknowledge a, a, one group of people then a single person, and then I have two announcements, and then I'm gonna give the word of God, okay? You ready? Um, If you're a parent of one of the wonderful children uh, that was down here, um, I want you to stay seated, but I want everyone else, if you don't have a kid in children's church this morning, I want you to stand to your feet, and I want us to bless the parents who brought kids, stood in line, who wrangled children during worship, Parents, you need to know you're crushing it. You're doing awesome. We bless you. We celebrate you. We honor you. Come on. There's work involved. Come on, bless them. Bless them. Bless them. Bless them. Come on, tell them they're doing so good. Sow a seed, a financial seed into them if you feel led. Give them money for lunch. Come on, bless them. Bless my wife. Woo! Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Listen, parents, I get it. I came last night without my kids. We got five of them. I came to church last night with no kids. It was nice. It was nice. I just showed up. I worshiped the whole time. Didn't think about any of the little ones. Just in the, just enraptured in glory. And when my kids are here doing WWF on the carpet it's sometimes hard to pay attention. And so I just want to acknowledge you. Um, We see you. God sees you. And you need to know and feel like this morning that you're crushing it. You're doing a great job. God wants you to know that. Amen? Be thou encouraged. Um, I want to honor someone. This may may just be uncomfortable because I don't know this person, but my sister in the back in the camo, can you stand up? It's you. You looked behind you. Yeah, you're wearing camo. 
So what's your name? What is it? Kylie. Kylie. Do we know Kylie? Everyone knows Kylie? Okay, I was in the back worshiping, and I looked. Kylie's Bible is filled with highlighter in, in pen. And I just want to honor you in the presence of the people of God for the time that you've spent in secret with him. And I just want to tell you, like, I don't know you, but I know you're going to finish well because I'm looking at your word and I know your heart is for him, that you really, really love God. And, and you say, you can't tell that from a, from a Bible. Yes, I can, because you don't spend that amount of time just out of duty. And I can tell even in your countenance that you really love him. And you know this, but he really loves you and he's pleased with you. And your time spent in secret is not in vain. And so I just want to bless you. You have something to say. You're anointed of God. And so don't wait to just run after him with all of your heart. Whatever he's put in your heart to do to advance the kingdom, just I bless you in Jesus' name. Can we honor her? I love it. I love the word of God so much. Um, so much so, segue into my, my shameless plug. Um, tomorrow night, Upper Room is offering a foundations course that will be filled up by today, I promise you. So Christy and Alzavian, can y'all come up here real quick? Just stand up and wave at everyone. So yes, this is my wife who's amazing and anointed and beautiful, and Alzavian who's a joy bomb. Uh, our small group, which we've been meeting together for about two years, we are hosting a, a foundations course going through my latest book, Now That You're Born Again. Um, and you may say, well, I'm, I'm not a new believer. And that's kind of how it's been branded. And it's true. Um, if you're not a new believer, that's fine. It's really foundation. So if your Christian life is up and then down and hot and then cold and you're riding the roller coaster of your emotions, your foundation may be a little wobbly. And so the whole purpose of this class for five weeks is to establish you in the new covenant, which is awesome. And so I'm guessing by the end of, the, end of today, it'll be full. So if that's you, um, then you say, I want to really get my, my foundations established in the new covenant. Um, I want to invite you to that personally. It's going to be awesome. It's going to be glorious. And so I think there's maybe 30 spots left. Um, and so you can connect table, go online, UR Dallas, whatever the website is. And there's, look at that, QR code. I'm living in 1995. There's QR codes, connect tables. Um, so bless you with that. Amen? Okay, last one. And then we're going to open the word of God. Um, on July 3rd, some of you know this, um, we are inviting our nation to take communion in Philadelphia. Um, so I'm inviting people in Philadelphia, in the tri-state areas to come. We're going to gather on Independence Mall, which is right there by the Liberty Bell. Um, what do we, oh, whoa, there's a bell in the sky on the painting. Praise God. All right. That's awesome. <laughs> well, let me just speak on that. So you, you may not know, but the Liberty Bell, how many of you know what the Liberty Bell is? Raise your hand if you know what the Liberty Bell is. Raise your hand. Okay. So 64 of you. Um, on the Liberty Bell, fun fact, is inscribed... Leviticus 25, I believe. On the bell in our nation, one of the most historic square miles in our nation in Philadelphia, we have this, this bell that was rung to gather the people to, to basically hold Congress and, and all these things. And so the bell cracked, we know the bell cracked, but on the bell is the Jubilee scripture, Leviticus 25, that says... Proclaim liberty throughout the land to all its inhabitants. And so that's what we're going to do on July 3rd. We're going to gather and we're going to, it's going to be a two hour broadcast service. So you can actually register online here. So you can register to join us in Philadelphia. Or you may just say, I want to gather people in my home. Or you may be a pastor or a leader of a church and you say, I want to gather people in my church. 
um, and you can do all of that on the website. So you can scan that, get involved there. We're gonna send out updates and teachings and all that. But basically what we're gonna do on July 3rd, and it's really significant, um, we believe that God has entrusted the body of Christ with the authority to act like a priest in the earth. And so one of the ways that we're gonna do that is we're gonna step into our priestly role by declaring, just like the high priest did, by offering the blood of a bull and goat on behalf of a nation, we're gonna hold up the sacrifice of Jesus and we're going to apply it to our nation saying your sins are forgiven you. And we're gonna declare the eternal jubilee that we have in Christ, which is our sins have been forgiven. Come on. We're gonna ring that bell of freedom. It's gonna be awesome. And so you can uh, sign up for that. All right, are y'all ready? Put your hand on your heart or head or whatever, wherever you want. You're a temple of the Most High. Remember that. God lives in there. Oh, Lord, we love you. Thank you for your word. Thank you for your spirit. Thank you for your face. Thank you for your name. Thank you for this covenant that we live in. God, I pray this morning uh, you would come close. You would manifest yourself to us. You would manifest your beauty and your majesty to us this morning in a way that would, that would just cripple our flesh, that would cripple our pride, that would cripple our dignity, that would cripple our self-consciousness, that would cripple our addictions, that would cripple sickness and disease in our bodies. Jesus, we welcome you to come and to cripple us with your majesty. And we bless you, God. We, the best we know how, we set our heart's affection on you. And Lord, as we open the word of God, I pray, Holy Spirit, that you would unveil the beauty of your son to us. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right, go to 1 John chapter 5. I'm going to read a lot of Bible. If you love the Bible, say Amen. Oh, can I say one thing about worship? Did y'all notice we were singing about giving God glory for about 40 minutes? I used to have a hard time connecting my heart to that phrase about giving God glory. I didn't know what that meant. And usually it was accompanied by incredible melodies that I would sing. And then about 30 minutes later, I'm like, what am I singing? Is anyone relate? I just gave some of you permission. You're like, wait a minute. Um, I realized that glory, one of the words for glory in the Bible is kabod. It's, it's the weighty glory of God. It's, it's, it's a weight. And the way I interpret it now, and I'm sure there's a number of interpretations, but the way I connect my heart to those songs that, that really ministers to me and I know ministers to the Lord is that the glory of God is the goodness of God. It's everything good about God. And to give God glory, you have to have glory. You cannot give God something that you don't have. This is why a lot of our hearts don't necessarily connect with that song. We're like, this just, it feels like the right thing to do to give God all the glory but we don't really have, we don't really know what glory is. And here's how I interpret that and get my heart in line with that phrase and that in those, those choruses is that everything good in my life, every nice thing that anyone has said about me, the beauty of my wife, the, the glory of my children, the glory of this wonderful church home, my health, my strength, my legs, my breath, every good thing that I have comes from God. It's glory. My good looks. <laughs> what you gotta have glory who said amen come here I love you <laughs> I did not hear a loud enough amen from my wife that's okay oh that was you okay <laughs> I, I heard many amens I was like yeah so you have to have glory so this is what we're saying we're saying God everything good that I have I know that I wasn't meant to carry it around because it's heavy Goodness that comes from God is heavy. You weren't meant to carry it and to, and, to, and to figure out how to possess it. You were meant to just give it back to God. We sang it, we sang it this morning. All it comes from you and it goes back to you. 
That's the beauty and the amazingness of that song. Okay? Amen. So when you hear that, you can connect your heart. All right. I just had to get that off of my, my chest. 1 John 5, 4 um, says this. For everyone who has been born of God overcomes the world. Sometimes you got to wait and just let yourself catch up to what you read. Yeah, there it goes. For everyone who has been born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory, say victory, victory, that has overcome the world, our faith. Our faith. This is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. And I want to remind us this morning about what we believe. That's what we're going to do this morning. You're going to leave this morning strengthened in the faith. Because... This faith is the victory that overcomes the world. And how many of you know right now, our world, our nation, there's a lot of wildness happening. I know you know because the airwaves are filled with news and knowledge about what's happening in our nation on a political realm, the immorality, sexual immorality, sexual brokenness, injustices, murders, like it's filling the airwaves. All of the darkness in our nation is filling the airwaves. But one of the things I love about Jesus and I love about the Christian faith is that you and I were born again to overcome all of that. I like overcoming. I don't like being overcome. You weren't designed to be overcome by sin and darkness and death and to live under a cloak of shame and heaviness and oh my gosh, the big bad world. Church, I wanna wanna exhort you from my heart. We have to stop being surprised by the darkness in the world. Too many believers are, are... Somehow, they're spending too much time being surprised at the darkness in the world. We sung it this morning. God, catch me up in your story all my life for your glory. Well, if you're born again, if you're born of God, I want to tell you, you have been caught up into an amazing story. And it goes like this. (laughs) Sin entered the world through a guy named Adam. And ever since then, sin has been producing all manner of wickedness and darkness and things that would cause, you know, it cause us to blush if we were to talk about it. There is nothing new under the sun. The sexual immorality, the brokenness, the injustices, the bloodshed, all the things happening in our nation, let me tell you, have happened before. There is nothing new happening right now. And at the root of all of it, and this is a paramount principle for the church. See, see, I see the church and we're talking about all of the symptoms or the fruits of sin. You name them. They, they, they show up on news headlines. People get, get murdered for no reason. It's awful. Sex trafficking. It's horrific the political corruption, people using other people as pawns and political gain and all the corrupt, it's everywhere. The, the, the agendas with the sexual brokenness and all of the things seeking to indoctrinate, and da 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 it is, it is fruit, but at the root, there is a common thread called sin. It is sin at the root, and as Christians, 
We must be unified in our approach to sin. We cannot be divided because here's what happens is we're, we're having all these conversations about the symptoms of sin in our nation, trying to find some sort of resolution, and we're not. We're, 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 we're clanging symbols and everyone's fighting for attention, pointing out to the symptoms, and very few people are pointing to the root of the chaos in our nation. I can tell you with certainty, as a son of God, that what's happening to our nation is something called sin. There is, a, there is a certain sense of peace and shalom that will fill your heart when you know that the venom or the what's at work is sin. So now all of a sudden you have permission to stop freaking out about all of the symptoms and go, okay, what does the Bible say about sin? How should I respond to sin in the world? How should I respond to sin in me? How should I respond to sin in my fellow believers? And this is what I want to remind us this morning, that we as, as sons and daughters of God, those who have been born of God, the Bible promises that we will overcome the world. What does that mean? It means that I can hear news articles about the chaos and not put my head in the sand and pretend that it doesn't happen. Pretend that, that the statistics aren't saying what they're saying. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm very aware that what's happening in my kids' public school, that there is, a, there is sin at work in my kids' public school that they're in. I have, I'm gonna have four kids in public school next year, and I'm very aware. I'm very aware of what's happening in the school. Very aware. We, we make it a point to stay aware. But we also make it a point I heard the father tell me, he says, I don't want you to be afraid for your children. This is what Israel, they were afraid to enter into the promised, into the promised land because they said, these giants are going to kill our children. And God was displeased with them because they were worried about their children. And God said, do you not think that I knew when your children would be born? So I'm aware of the darkness, and yet I'm more aware of the light. I'm more aware of the majesty of Jesus. I'm more aware of the power of the gospel. And so I want my, my, my children to be filled with the knowledge of God. Why? So that they can fill that school with the knowledge of God. That's not just hype. That's not just emotionalism. That's the fact and the reality of the Bible. Those who are born of God will overcome the world. How do you know the world is overcoming you? You know the world is overcoming you because your, your consciousness is filled with what's happening in the world. And you're responding emotionally and mentally and in all of your conversations to what's happening in the world, not what happened is happening in heaven and not what happened 2,000 years ago on the cross. This is what we covenanted to do as Christians. When you said, God, I surrender my life to you, you said this. You said, God, I'm purposing no longer to be obsessed with the world, but to be obsessed with you and to live my life accordingly. When you see Jesus, it's an event. To see God is an event. You hear people talk about all the time, they, they were at a sports game. Oh, were you at, I was at Nolan Ryan's seventh no-hitter. I was present at the game. People said, wow. I saw the game. It was an event. It was a historic event if you know baseball. I was there. I had a, was a little boy and I got a beer thrown on me. I'll never forget the feeling of being baptized in beer. I was like, oh, what is that? <laughs> oh. Seeing God is an event. You can't look at God and be the same. You can't see God and see who he is and what he's done and just stay the same. It, it does something to your insides. The same way when you look at a beautiful mountain range and you're like, you exhale and you're like, oh, wow. 
When you see God, the very substance of God comes inside of you. Why? Because the air around God is different. Like God, the, the molecules of air around God are different. They, they smell different. They taste different. They make you feel some kind of way. Your heart begins to get confident and be built up. And all of a sudden, the darkness doesn't feel dark. Why? Because you are light and you're in the presence of light. And this is what we need, church, in this hour. We need courage. We need strength. We need a strong, living, vital faith that doesn't ignore the darkness, but that goes, wow, I am a burning one because I bear the image of my creator, and I'm going to go into the world, and I'm going to shine, and I'm not going to be afraid of it. I'm going to go if I'm going to be a teacher or a politician or in the entertainment industry or, or start gospel crusades to declare the beautiful majesty of the gospel. This is what we need in this hour. This is not a time to shrink back but unless it's it's our faith that overcomes the world it's not your faith you see people get alone in their closet like it's my faith no it's not you don't get to have a faith apart from the Christian church that has existed since Pentecost it is our faith people can't deconstruct the faith Everyone's afraid of people deconstructing the Christian. You can't deconstruct the Christian faith. It's forever and it centers upon Jesus. You can either get in line with it because it's an eternal foundation or you were never on it. You think some clever people in different parts of the earth and then hmm, I'm gonna deconstruct. No, you're deconstructing some man-made experience you had. And rightfully so, deconstruct it till the bones, until you find yourself upon the rock. Because when your life is founded upon the rock, guess what? You're going to be standing until he comes shining like a star going, I'm ready for you. My master, my savior, my Lord, I'm not going to throw in the towel. I'm not going to quit come hell or high water persecution coming at me. You can threaten me with death all you want. People talking about you're going to take, take this and that from me. You cannot take something from me that you never gave to me. I'm not living for this earth. I'm not living for, for, for the rights. People talk about their rights. and the, Listen, let's fight for the rights, but let's seek the kingdom of God. Let's seek the kingdom of God. And I trust that as we seek the kingdom of God and we manifest and mature as sons and daughters, we're gonna see, we're gonna see righteousness fill the earth. Oh, I, I pray this, this season that we're in as the church that you give yourself over to maturing into the image of Christ. There is not a, a more glorious journey than to give yourself to mature into his image, into his likeness. Every other thing is a distraction. Every other thing is a distraction. The Christian faith promises that we can actually mature as a people into his likeness. I cannot think of a higher calling and a higher story than that. That sin would be broken off of my life. I used to be a professional sinner. I was a professional. Did y'all know that? I was, I, I, used, I was a professional at it. I was so good at it. I was so good at it. I was running the game in North Dallas. And then I met Jesus. And now I, I still sin. But it is really, really difficult. That just offended some of you. It's difficult. Because for the last 15 years, I have purposed in my heart. Listen, I'm not perfect. She will testify to you. I testify publicly. I yelled at my kids before I came to service last night. Yelled at them. I think for a good reason. because I was in my flesh. <laughs> but the more that I see God, the more that I've lived purposing to put my heart upon him, the harder it is to live for myself, to live in sin, to live bound in self-consciousness. And this is where we're heading. God wants you to overcome. 
He wants you to be filled with the new wine of the new covenant, to be joyful, to be glad. He's breaking the spirit of grumpy off the church in this hour. There's too many grumpy Christians taking themselves way too seriously. You're not that important. You're just not that important. Your sin, your sin does not impress God. And it should not impress the leadership of the church. Your sin doesn't impress me. I'm not impressed by it. I'm, I'm just not. I'm impressed by the gospel of Jesus Christ. I don't want to minimize your pain, but I will not idolize your sin. There's a difference. Let the Father heal your pain. Bring your pain to him. But you put your sin away. And it's time to live free. It's time to drink. Listen, listen, the very first church service, everyone looking thought the people were drunk. There is a value to being intoxicated by God. The most intoxicated people that we read about, the people looking, they go, these people are drunk. Meaning, physically, they were overcome by the Spirit. Oh, what has he been drinking? But those intoxicated people were the most sober-minded about the Great Commission. They were the most on purpose, on fire, holy, sanctified, set apart, not some emotionalism. They were possessed with God. I'm surprised that those folks filled with the Holy Ghost on Pentecost, that that's all that it looked like, is that they were just been drinking a little wine. Come on, we believe that God lives in us. How do we not just like levitate or explode? Y'all are laughing at me. I don't know what you believe. We, we believe that God lives in us. Do you not know, the Bible says, that your, temp, your body, your body, your body, your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit. Do you not know? Do you not know? That's what the Bible says. Do you not know? Do, don't you know? Don't you know? Didn't you know? Don't you know? Your body is a temple. What's he saying? God lives in there. So next time you go to look at something, pornography or engage in sexual immorality, be reminded that God lives in there. Just be reminded that God is in there. And I wonder if the consciousness of God being in there, when you go to look at your phone, you're like, yeah, I don't want to do that. Why? Because you're trying so hard not to do the thing? No, because you're conscious of God. You're aware of this beautiful, wonderful man who himself is joy. <laughs> Come on. We need to be intoxicated in the spirit in this hour. Why? So that we can be sober-minded in the Great Commission. Sober-minded to care for the church of God. The, oh, man, I feel his zeal this morning. And I'm not even close to my notes. That's okay. <clears throat> I have found personally that we need to give ourselves permission uh, to be glad in God. You have to give yourself permission. You, you have to be willing to repent or to change the way that you're thinking about the Christian faith. For too many, for too many years, for too long, we have accepted and tolerated a joyless Christianity. At some point, the gospel should make you glad. If in his presence there is, it should look like something. If Paul and Silas can be in prison singing hymns to God, you think they were doing that because they were supposed to? Hey, hey, Silas, I, I feel like the right thing to do. I feel like the right, I feel like we should, you feel like we should do that? No, 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 no. These guys were possessed. They were like, they were like, we just got beaten for our faith. <laughs> do you remember when he said, blessed are you when they persecute you and falsely rejoice Rejoice because they persecuted the prophets who were before you. you hey, do you remember when he said that? I remember. We, this must be because we are associated, we're one with him. This wouldn't have happened if we didn't have union with Christ. Hallelujah. 
and then a bomb goes off and their chains break off and the prison cells open. Come on! But for us, if that happened, it's like, hey, I think I need to go on sabbatical. These dudes, they put me in prison. I was there for six months. Come on! I don't want to diminish where we're at. I just want to appeal to us to come up higher. I'm not trying to make small of where we're at in our thinking. I'm trying to provoke you without needlessly offending you. Go to Genesis 3. I'm going to just leave you with this. I want you to see this progression. I mentioned, this is really important, this dot, that, that sin is at the root of all the chaos and confusion that you see. Okay? So, so please let us stop being impressed by evil, impressed by darkness, all of that. Let's recognize that the biblical truth says that sin is at work through Adam, and because death entered through sin, it spread to all man through this one man. But in like manner, righteousness comes to all men through Jesus Christ. You with me? So when you see sickness and disease and immorality and brokenness in all the manner, just think of it as a tree and sin is the root of that tree. And if you can figure out a way biblically to deal with the root, eventually the fruit will wither up and die. All right. Genesis chapter 3, I want us to look at and examine how sin entered through Adam so that you can get insight into where sin is still at work in your life. And here's what I believe. I believe that for many of us, God has subdued the external acts of sinfulness in many of our lives. Praise God. If that's you, you're like, man, I'm not struggling with the same outward sins that I did years ago. Come on, raise your hand. Let me see your freedom. It's okay to be free in church. Okay, but here I believe there is still sin at work in the body of Christ that's preventing us from seeing God and responding rightly, and I want you to see this, all right? I'm gonna hurry, because we're gonna, I'm not gonna hurry, but I'm gonna hurry a little bit. All right, are you in Genesis 3? Say amen, I want, you have to see this in your Bible, and I'm gonna, you're gonna leave here, and you're gonna be like, that, what did that guy say? You're like, it's in the Bible, so read your Bible. I promise you, it's why I'm gonna speak from the Bible. Uh, Adam and Eve in the garden. Uh, we'll start in verse, uh, in verse six. This is Eve. So when the woman saw, say saw. She saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the what? Delight to the what? And that the tree was desired to make one what? She took of its fruit. What did she do? She took the fruit. Did she receive the fruit? She took the fruit. She took the fruit and ate and she also gave some to her husband. My, my, my who was with her, and he ate. Now God had told Adam, and he had told Adam, the day you eat of this tree, you'll surely die. So I'm reading my Bible, and I'm thinking the next verse is, and then they died. Look at verse seven. This is the first thing that happened to man after they sinned. It says, then the eyes of both were opened, and they knew that they were naked. Let me pause you right here. I thought their eyes were already open because she saw that the tree was nice, that it was a delight to the eyes, and that it was desired to make one wise. So the Bible is telling us that there was some aspect of Adam and Eve's sight that was blind prior to eating of this tree. Because the Bible wouldn't have told us that their eyes were opened if their eyes weren't previously closed. And what I believe happened, and I'm just sharing this for the sake of time, is that prior to eating of the what? The knowledge of good and evil, the only thing Adam and Eve were conscious of is God. All they could see, all they could see was God. 
They were like, hey, what do you know? People say, hey, hey, what do you know? Uh, God. What's the good word? Uh, God. Why do you look like that? Why are you smiling all the time? You should see what I'm looking at. I'm looking at love himself. It's awesome. They were walking around in the garden, and watch this. Did God make them naked? Genesis 2, 24. The man and wife were both naked, and they were? So is there anything wrong with Adam and Eve's nakedness? Was their nakedness a sin? Are you sure? Are you sure? I'm setting you up. Are you sure? <laughs> Watch. I want you to see this in your Bible. Don't, it, it, I'm reading the Bible. So, so the first thing that happened to Adam and Eve is their eyes opened, and what did they know? They knew that they were naked. They became self-conscious, self-aware. So the fall of man produced a self-awareness. Adam and Eve... Make no mistake, they disobeyed the command and that was sin, was it not? They disobeyed the command, that was sin and death began to spread in. But I want you to see how death began to spread. It started in the garden. They were still in the garden. They were still in the presence of God. And they knew that they were naked. They became self aware. Their eyes were opened. They became self-conscious. And we know from the Bible that they began to judge themselves. Watch this. Keep reading. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths. Stay with the scripture. They knew that they were naked. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife did what? So God walks into the garden, and this is, this is man who sinned against God, who broke God's command, and, he, and, and they walk into the garden, and I would think that the Bible would say, and then God began to hide himself from mankind. That's how our, most of our theology is. Man sinned, and then God began to hide himself from man. But the Bible says that, that man sinned, he knew he was naked, and God actually showed up into the garden where he had always shown up to be with man. But the Bible says, my Bible says, that the first separation between God and man was not on God's end. It was Adam hiding himself from the presence of God. First with a fig leaf and then physically withdrawing into the trees away from God. The first effect of sin was not God saying, you can't be close. It was man saying, I can't be close. Do you see it? Now pay attention. This gets worse. <laughs> they hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of their garden. This is what I love about God. He's a wonderful father. But the Lord God called to the man and said to him, where are you? I don't believe it was, where are you? I believe it was, where are you? Why are you not where you've always met me before? God was still willing to meet with man. Where are you? Watch this. This is profound. And Adam said, I heard the sound of you. Before God ever addressed anything, he just heard the rustling of God walk in. He heard the sound of God in the garden. Watch this. Oh my goodness. And Adam said, I was afraid. Why were you afraid, Adam? Because I was naked. Huh? Most of you read this narrative and you think Adam was afraid because he disobeyed the command and that he did something wrong, but that's not what the Bible teaches. The reason Adam hid from God is really, 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 really important. We project our knowledge of the situation onto the story. We think Adam hid from God because he was aware that he disobeyed God. That's not what the Bible teaches. We're aware that Adam disobeyed God, but Adam... The reason he hid, he says, the reason I hid from you and the reason I was afraid is because I was naked. If I was counseling Adam, I would say, hey, Adam, listen, bro, you've really screwed this thing up for everybody. <laughs> 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 
But I got news for you, dude. You are hiding from God for the wrong reason. I see you hiding. I understand why you're hiding, but it's the wrong reason. There's nothing wrong with your nakedness. So what happened? Why the wires get crossed? Adam took his newfound knowledge of good and evil that he was never meant to have, looked at his nakedness, which was good in God's eyes, and he called it bad. This is one of the primary effects of sin running rampant in the body of Christ today, is you're looking at your life calling bad what God calls good. Believers are judging themselves unclean, unworthy of God's love. Why? Because they're conscious of themselves. But the gospel intended to break you out of that hell, to break you out of that perpetual assessment and analysis of yourself, and to, and to deliver you once and for all to where all you could see is a loving father who's looking at you, who's not, who's not unjust. Listen, the, 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 God of, the God of the Bible, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, he's, he's both just and the justifier. So sin had to be dealt with. And I've got good news for you. It was. It was dealt with. You have permission from now until he comes home to trust yourself to his gaze. I'm telling you, the church is in a prison of her own self-consciousness. And we've created, we, we create ministries and we, and we somehow like marinate in this reality that allows people to stay self-conscious. And yeah, and, and we start applying principles and scriptures. And yeah, I'm trying, I'm working on this, I'm working on that. Listen, the work of the cross is sufficient. Just touch it. Get in tune with it. I have been crucified with Christ. Everything that was wrong with me was nailed to the cross 2,000 years ago. I have been buried with Christ. I've been resurrected to newness of life. I'm seated with Christ in heavenly places. I have a God who is on high, a great high priest who prays for me. This is what we believe. This is what we believe. Come on, this is what we believe. Don't will you be distracted. I, I want to throw this table. I don't know why there's more of you not in the fetal position kicking stuff. I'm serious. Is this not? This is good news. The Apostle Paul, 1 Corinthians 4. Oh, I'm, gonna, I'm, gonna, I'm going. I'm just going to go. He says, listen. Listen, he says, he says, guys, it's a small thing that I'm judged by you or any human court. He says, I don't even judge myself. I'm not aware of anything against myself. This is the Apostle Paul. But watch this. So what is he saying? He goes, my conscience is so clean towards me because I live with the lens of God and the gospel and what he's done on my behalf. He was clean. But watch this. This is so important. He goes, but that doesn't mean I'm thereby acquitted. That doesn't mean I'm perfect. That doesn't mean everything I do is in step. He goes, it is the Lord who judges me. He goes, but watch this. Do not pronounce judgment until the day, until Christ comes. What's he saying? He's saying, I live from this day of judgment on the cross 2,000 years ago. I'm clean, and I'm going to live with my face upon a smiling father. The best I know how, I'm going to live my life knowing that I may stumble. I may fall, and as I'm looking at my papa, as I'm looking in covenant, this covenant of love with my father, I know that I know that I know that if I stumble, he gave me the spirit as a deposit. I don't need to go self-searching, self-analyzing. Holy Spirit's going to testify. Whoop, that wasn't right, and you're like, yeah, I don't want that. I don't want that. And you're just going to go, I repent of that. I'm a son of God. I was born of God. I'm going to overcome the world. And you keep walking with a clear conscience, free from the obsession of yourself, the obsession of your calling. So many people worried about your calling, your calling, your calling. You are called to be born again. What, what better calling is, is there to be than to be born of God? I wonder why, I, I don't know why I stood up there. <laughs> I just like, uh, no, I'm so serious. If you get this calling to be born of God, every other calling is subservient to the calling to be born of God. Until you value it and like it and enjoy it, you will be, 
you will be tireless and depressed and, and anxious. Listen, I love being a husband. I love being a dad. I love getting to do what I do. I love coaching soccer. I love soccer. All the things. But my calling in life is to be born of God and to manifest as a son. And so when that's my calling, guess what? I can do that as a father. I can do that as a husband. If God says, hey, I want you to go do this, I can go do that and I'm not gonna be panicking because my calling is to be a son. And I'm not worried so much about my identity being wrapped up in what I do, but in who I've become in him. And so now I'm free and I don't have to compare myself to you or to someone else. I can actually celebrate you. I can look at someone in the marketplace making all kinds of money and I can go, man, that's awesome. Do you tithe? You know, <laughs> I don't know why. <laughs> I pointed right at Mike. He does, he does. No, he, you don't tithe, he just gives it all away. So listen, are you with me? Are you guys with me? I wish we had like another couple hours. I, we don't, we don't. Y'all say we do, we don't. We don't. Y'all play. Y'all play too much. Can y'all, can the band come back up? Can the band come back up, please? Um, So the progression of sin is that it started with knowledge. It opens your eyes. You become self-conscious. Watch this. You become self-conscious, and then you hide from the presence of God. This is happening everywhere because we've been obsessed with the fruits of sin, and we haven't addressed the root of sin, and that is the root. That progression is at the root of all sin. It's a knowledge that you were never meant to have that opened your eyes to yourself you become obsessed with self, and then you hide yourself from the presence of God with fig leaves, and you pretend, and you do all this, this business. But let me tell you this. The power of the gospel is very simply this. It's the knowledge of Christ that opens your eyes to him, that produces a consciousness of God that allows you to abide in the presence of God. I didn't know what y'all were doing. I realized they put my notes up there. I was like, y'all pay attention. <laughs> Do you see this? This happened in Luke 24. Stay with me. I'm just going to tell you this, and then we're going to adore the Lord. Luke 24. Stay with me. Verse 30. Jesus is resurrected, and he's walking with a guy named Cleopas and another guy on the road to Emmaus. And, and the Bible says that their eyes did not recognize him. So here a couple of guys are, they're walking with the resurrected Jesus and they couldn't see him, but they were with him. They were, they were with him, they were with the resurrected Jesus. How many of you think you could be in the presence of the resurrected Jesus and maybe not know it? So they were walking with him and Jesus begins to open the scriptures to them concerning himself. If I was the resurrected Jesus, I would have just been like, ta-da, <laughs> it's me. But he didn't do that. He actually pointed them to this. And then he gets onto a table with them and the Bible says he was at the table and he, and he gave thanks for the bread and he broke the bread and he gave them the bread. The Bible says he gave them the bread. He says he gave them the bread. They didn't take the bread. He gave them the bread. They didn't take the bread. They took, they received the bread. And the Bible says this, and then their eyes were opened. They ate the bread and all of a sudden their blindness to God from the garden through the broken bread, huh, he gave it to them. He gave it to them. He finally gave them something to remedy their blindness to God. And he says, look, he says, look, my broken body, you no longer have to be obsessed with your body. You can receive the bread, which is my body. And this is what I want you to fix your eyes. Their eyes were opened and they said, did not our hearts burn within us? What I'm believing this morning 
that the Father wants to do is He wants to destroy self-consciousness. He wants to destroy and break the endless cycle of self-judgment and self-assessment and self-awareness. And He wants to liberate you into the glorious freedom of beholding your Father. So just, just the best you know how. We've already eaten of the broken body. We're gonna just take these last few minutes. If you need to get your kids, get them and bring them back. But, but don't miss this moment. I really believe with all my heart that he's setting trajectories this morning. He's changing the direction of your life and he's gonna bring you into the fullness of joy. And so just give him your heart, your attention. These guys are gonna lead us as we close. this morning that might sound funny to y'all but I didn't uh, so I feel like this scripture is really pertinent because it goes right along with what he what he shared and the scripture is this uh, the disciples are looking at a blind man and they say to Jesus they say uh, was it his sins or the sins of his parents that he was born blind and Jesus says it was not because of his sins or his parents sins Jesus answered this happened so that the power of God could be seen in him so I just wanna say this, that there are some of you, and, and just like Peter shared, he's wanting to release you to stop looking at the sins of your own self or the sins of your parents. And he's saying, 
whatever it is that happened to you, it's so that my glory might be seen in your body. It's so that the power of God might be seen in you. And so I wanna invite you up. If you have been soul searching for your own sin or the sins of your parents, I wanna give you permission to stop doing that. And I want you to come forward and receive the freedom that God has for you. It's so that the glory of God might be realized in your body. So I'm gonna invite the, our prayer team up to pray. But if you've been stuck in a cycle of looking at your own sin or the sin of your parents in order to figure out what's wrong with you, I just wanna say be free and you have freedom to come forward this morning and to say, I'm gonna stop doing that. I'm gonna look at the lamb who came and it was slain for me. So Jesus, I just thank you, God. I say thank you, God, Lord. God, I say thank you for what you've accomplished, Lord. And I say that it's all free, God. So God, I ask those that are stuck in sin and those that are stuck in bondage,
beginning of the service, I just heard lymphoma. And I don't really even know exactly what that means, but I just keep being reminded of it. Um, so if someone in here has lymphoma or knows someone that has lymphoma, um, would you just come here, come up here, and I think we're just gonna pray for you <laughs> as the body and then sing this over you, if that's you. If not, that's cool too. Just extend our hands. What's your name? Okay, this is Erin, and her aunt's name is Diane, and her aunt has lymphoma. So, Father, we just lift up Diane. We thank you that, that your blood and your body were given for Diane, for her infirmities, for lymphoma, that hell, that sickness, that disease has no hold over Diane's body. <laughs> because there's a blood that speaks a better word. And it says she's free. Diane is free. So I thank you, Father. I thank you for the blood of your son that flows through Diane's veins. We ask, Father, your son Jesus that you would be healed we say your sins are forgiven in Jesus name Amen. Lift me up, turn me around place my feet on solid ground I thank the master I thank the savior because you heal my heart you change my name Yeah, in fact, if you have um, any sickness in your body at all, we want to invite you to come forward and receive prayer. He bore our illness, our sickness, and our shame so that we could be liberated into his fullness, his life, eternal health. So I want to bless you. Come receive prayer. We love you. Keep praising. It doesn't have to end just because the service is ending. Praise him over brunch, amen. Shine in front of your waiters. <laughs> we love you guys. We'll see you next week or in the prayer room this week.